Thank you so much for joining our session. Today, I'll be highlighting a few best practices on how you can create a safe and comfortable online research environment for your participants. Before we get started, I wanted to give everyone a quick overview of what we'll be looking to discuss today. I'll start by doing a brief introduction for those of you who do not know me or are not familiar with Recollective. From there, we'll set the stage by discussing the current research landscape and how safety fits into that equation. Then we'll do a deep dive into the five steps that you can take as a researcher to ensure your projects are more participant-centric and address key areas of vulnerability and safety. As part of that, we'll provide you with a few best practices to consider when designing and executing your online qualitative studies. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Laura Polito, and I'm the VP of Research Services at Recollective. Before joining Recollective, I worked on both the client and the supplier side of market research, specializing in conducting studies through various digital methods, including both short and long-term communities. Within my current role at Recollective, I help provide guidance to brands, agencies, and researchers to help them develop the best project solutions to meet their needs, leveraging Recollective's innovative technology. And for those of you who are not familiar, Recollective is a software platform for conducting online qualitative studies and fostering insight communities. We first launched the platform in 2011 and are used by market researchers around the world. Customers can use Recollective as a DIY tool to execute their projects, or they can lean on our team of in-house experts for support when it comes to consultation on research design, best practices, or getting your project set up prior to launch. We also have a network of preferred partners that help fill in the gaps when it comes to recruiting, participant management, incentive fulfillment, or even be an extra set of hands when it comes to moderation analysis and reporting. Right now we're used by over a thousand organizations worldwide and can support more than 25 different languages. Recollective also scales to any device so participants can engage with your study using their desktop, mobile device, or tablet. So before we dive into the details, I think it's important to set the stage and provide some context as to why the idea of safety is such an important topic when it comes to research design given our current climate. I think it comes as no surprise that today's current climate is very different from even a few years ago. With a slew of major global events that are impacting the political, economical, and environmental climate, consumers have a heightened sense of awareness and are feeling more vulnerable now than ever before especially when it comes to matters surrounding their health, privacy, and financial stability. And as a result, consumers have become increasingly aware of their choices and actions as it relates to their views, values, and well-being, both on a personal and a professional level. From who they choose to surround themselves with, where they choose to work, where they feel comfortable going, what they feel comfortable doing, and what brands or companies they choose to support, there's a shift away from habitual behaviors and purchases of the past to customers being more mindful and intentional when it comes to their actions, including the products and the services that they buy and consume. On one hand, all of this demonstrates the increased need for companies and brands to be more customer-centric at their core, while at the same time, making a strong case for an increase in the market research budget to better understand the shifts in mindset and behavior and what those implications are. Now, on the other hand, it also showcases that we as researchers also need to shift our focus to be more mindful and intentional when it comes to our research design, rather than relying on habitual methods of the past. It also demands that attention be paid to the areas where people are feeling most vulnerable. So more specifically, their health, privacy, and financial stability. So what does this really mean for us as researchers? I think the first thing to acknowledge is that defaulting to our tried and true methods of the past aren't always gonna be the optimal approach moving forward. At minimum, this means being aware of the different options we now have at our disposal to help address what's really at the core of those areas of vulnerability, which is safety and the role that safety plays when it comes to participant health, privacy and stability. So what I'd like to do today is dive into the different areas that we as researchers can build trust and create a more comfortable research environment for our participants so that they feel like they're in a safe space to share their true selves and opinions 
which will ultimately lead to better insights for your study. So let's start by exploring the idea of being more customer or participant centric. Thinking back to what we just discussed, I mentioned the idea of brands being more customer centric. And what I mean by this is simply putting the customer first and at the center of everything that you do. Organizations that take steps to better understand their customer are in a better position to make strategic decisions that not only benefit the company, but benefit the customer as well. The benefit of being more customer centric is that a company or organization can increase loyalty and attract new customers more easily, all while delivering products and services that better meet those customers' needs. So if we as researchers are looking for ways to build trust and create a better research environment, the key will be to adopt a similar model so that we switch our habitual behavior from designing studies with the sole purpose of meeting research objectives to being more intentional in our approach so that we place a larger emphasis on what the experience will be like for those who are participating in our study. When you create with a dual lens, you'll find that your research not only addresses your objectives, but you wind up getting more and even better insight from your participants because they're enjoying the experience and are more comfortable opening up. On a basic level, there's a few steps that you can take to ensure that your research projects are more participant-centric and address key concerns of vulnerability and safety. So things like understanding your target, choosing the right approach, creating a comfortable environment, building trust with your participants, and showing that you value their time through tokens of appreciation. Now let's dive into each of these in more detail. The first step is better understanding your target. As a researcher, you spend a lot of time upfront identifying criteria in order to help you recruit participants into your study. But when I say understand your target, I mean going beyond the screener and quotas to put yourself in the shoes of your participants to better understand who they are. What I suggest is immersing yourself in the research design process as if you were that target participant and think about their motivations for joining the study, the experience they might be anticipating and the communication surrounding the project. Things like the tone of voice and how you're delivering that message. This perspective will ultimately help you design a better research experience for your participants. Once you have a handle on your target and the experience they might be anticipating, you can then think through the different options of how to best approach your research objectives while keeping your participants' needs into consideration. So for example, would this target be more comfortable in an in-person or an online setting? Would they respond better to something that's done in real time or appreciate the flexibility of doing something more asynchronously? Is this a topic or category that's better suited for a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Or would participants be comfortable engaging in a group? You'll also want to think through how much time they could dedicate to the project and how it could be structured to best accommodate their schedules. And you might be thinking, yes, this is a no-brainer. I do this for all of my studies. But the reason I'm calling this out specifically is because I think we need to add that additional layer of attention as it applies to the participant comfortability and safety. Along with being intentional in those selections rather than defaulting to the tried and true of the past. Again, having that participant centric mindset to ensure that the research design addresses those vulnerabilities when it comes to health, privacy and safety. Since the start of the pandemic, qualitative researchers have had to factor health, privacy, and safety into their work more than ever. The literal safety and well being of not only their participants' health, but also their own. And while we all know the benefits and drawbacks of conducting qualitative research in person compared to online, physical safety in terms of health was never really a factor in that decision before. And this was the driving factor in forcing many researchers to move their projects online during the pandemic, whether it be due to lockdowns or restrictions. Even when facilities started opening up, there was a fear that participants who raised their hands to participate in these types of in-person events could be biased based on their comfortability and might not be a true representation of the full target audience. While I think some aspects of that continues, 
12 researchers are now in a better position to make their selections on what feels right for their project, their clients, and their participants. And it can even be a combination of everything we just talked about. While there are many ways to make an in-person research experience safer for participants at this stage of the game, online still presents an easy, viable option when participant safety and comfortability are of top concern. And that's what we're gonna focus on in this section since that's where we have our most expertise. A comfortable online environment can mean different things to different people, and it can demand a different experience depending on the category or topic of research at hand. Let's take a look at the different ways that you can leverage technology to tailor that experience. While many platforms have similar options, the examples we're gonna provide in this section are of features and functionality that are available in Recollective. When designing the community environment, you'll want to familiarize yourself with all of the tools and features you have at your disposal to help tailor the experience to your audience and to your research needs. A great place to start is by visualizing what your community could look like in terms of color, design, imagery, and branding. It'll be your participants' first impression of your study, and you'll want to make the experience as inviting as possible. You can brand the study, or you could use logos and different colors and images that are on brand or on theme. And outside of the design itself, you'll want to think about the content. And when we say content, it's not just your research activities, it's everything else that's displayed on your site that contributes to the experience or can make a lasting impression with your participants. Within Recollective, there's the opportunity to have participants acknowledge terms and conditions or other study policies when they sign in for the first time. We recommend that these be clearly worded so that they're easy for participants to understand and avoid any legal jargon if possible. Recollective also provides the option to customize a study homepage for your project. This is where your participants will land after they accept those agreements. Outside of deciding how this page will look and feel, it's a great place to introduce yourself as the moderator, explain what the project will entail, and clearly set expectations. The more information you can share, the better. So again, think back to what you would wanna know as a participant to anticipate the information that should be included because the more you share, the more comfortable they'll be sharing with you. And comfort isn't just from that first impression. It's important to consider comfort throughout all stages of your project, and that includes the activities themselves. When you're ready to start planning your activities and drafting your guide, I ask you to keep a few things in mind. The first is to be sensitive, both in the way that you're asking questions and to be considerate in what you're asking them to share. And again, to create the most comfortable research environment that's conducive to sharing, we ask that you put yourself in the participant's shoes and don't ask them to share or do anything that you wouldn't be comfortable doing yourself. In addition, we recommend using familiar language and tone when drafting your questions so that they're relatable. Next, you wanna create as much flexibility as possible in how participants are able to respond to questions. For instance, as qualitative researchers, we love video responses, but participants might not be comfortable creating videos for specific questions. So rather than requiring video responses for everything, it's great to give participants the option to create a video or write a text response or share any images, or you could do any combination of the three. Or rather than making personal pictures mandatory, you can also allow participants to select stock photos to upload or provide them with a photo library or collage to select images from instead. You can even make certain questions optional if they're very sensitive in nature. And lastly, you'll wanna lead by example. And this isn't meant to bias your participants in any way, but rather to help them feel more sure of themselves when responding. So for instance, if you want people to create an introduction video telling the moderator about themselves, the moderator could create a video asking the question and then answering it themselves, or for activity introductions and tasks, a moderator could include their own introduction or response as a video if they're requesting a video as well. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned the idea of determining whether your approach should include private or socialized interactions. 
I want to revisit that here because I think it plays a key role when designing your research activities. In general, if you're looking to create a lively social environment between participants, you have the flexibility to have them share as much as they're able and willing to provide. But if privacy is of most concern, or you have a category or topic that's highly sensitive, you can scale back what's displayed accordingly to help tailor that experience and provide something that is the most comfortable for them. When creating activities, researchers tend to fall into two camps. So those that choose to keep everything private or one-on-one -on -one to start, and those that prefer to have socialization between their participants. This can be as simple as choosing to do live individual interviews versus doing online focus groups with your participants. But socialization extends much further and can be much more nuanced, especially if you're blending methods online or taken in an asynchronous approach. When looking to create a comfortable environment, the answer doesn't always mean choosing one approach over the other, but it does demand that you put thought into what you'll be asking the participants to do and how that's communicated to them. To do this, you can create intentional socialization within your study. If you tend to default to creating private activities, you can layer in an element of socialization by driving participants to a related discussion after they complete their one-on-one -on -one activity with the moderator. Making these discussions optional provides an added layer of comfort if participants just want to lurk and read other responses rather than contribute themselves. It gives an element of being social and providing that connection, but without being intrusive. You could also create an uninfluenced activity where people go through and submit their responses independently, but are told once they finish, they'll be shared with the group and they can read other responses as well. So rather than defaulting to this for every activity, you can pick and choose activities that would be less sensitive in nature. Again, adding that element of socialization without making participants feel uncomfortable. Now, if you're not worried about bias, you could even choose for those activities to be social from the start so that participants can read through other responses before they participate in your activities or you could create a discussion section on the site that remains open for participants to socialize on different topics or add their own topics. Again, this is just highlighting how it doesn't have to be an all or nothing approach when it comes to socialization. You can layer in different levels intentionally throughout where it would benefit the research, but also taking into consideration how comfortable the participants will be sharing on those topics. And finally, something that seems very obvious and simple, but often gets overlooked, is configuring your study settings to take into account how your participants will appear to each other, along with how they'll appear to any clients or observers you invite to view the study. So the first thing to consider is how participant names will be displayed. Within Recollective, personal information is not shared by default, and there are options to tailor what's displayed. So meaning you can share a participant's full name, their first name, last initial, first name only, first name with an ID, username, or just have a generic participant ID displayed. We rarely recommend that full names are displayed, but at times the study will work with a first name and a last initial or a first name only. But if you're looking to create the highest level of comfortability, you could simply create participant IDs to help people feel anonymous or even create themed usernames. So for example, you could choose say different animals or different city names. From there, you can even choose whether or not the participants upload an image to be displayed along with their ID when they respond on the site. If they choose not to upload an image, a bubble will appear with a letter representing their ID. Even if you provide the option to let them select a profile image, you can always configure the study so that these pictures are not visible to other participants or the clients, adding another layer of personal protection if needed. And the last thing you wanna consider is the visibility and inclusion of a participant directory or profile pages. While profile pages are great for more ongoing studies or studies with high socialization, they aren't always the best tool when a study is more sensitive in nature. Recollective also gives the option to hide profile pages and or the participant directory from other participants or even the clients and observers if needed. Again, there isn't one right answer in how everything should be configured or displayed, 
but it's what's right for your study and your participants. What's most important is that you're aware of all of the tools at your disposal to customize the experience and you use them accordingly to create that comfortable environment and safe space that's conducive to sharing. Similarly, it's so important for you as the moderator to be able to make meaningful human connections with your participants, regardless of the method that you choose. Building that relationship will help establish trust and also add to that comfortable environment we just discussed. The first step is establishing credibility as the moderator. You can do this by introducing yourself to the participants and sharing personal information, similar to what you would ask them to share, or even by demonstrating your knowledge or connection to the topic or category. Within Recollective, you can include this information on the homepage using a moderator card or even creating a moderator video. Next, I encourage you to say hi. And by this, I mean, let the participants know that there's someone behind that moderator card. I encourage you to leave a comment on their first response to say hello, thank them for participating in the study, and even make a connection based on the participant's response. So for example, if someone mentions their dog, you could say, oh, I have a dog too. Not only will this let them know that there's someone there reading their responses, but it'll actually encourage them to continue participating. Making those connections not only builds trust and comfort, but it tends to lead to better participation because participants are then more likely to continue through with the project and leave more detailed responses. A lot of times researchers spend time crafting their content for the homepage and welcome letter at the start of the project, but that's also where it ends. We encourage you to provide regular updates through the homepage or through an email broadcast to not only reinforce that someone's there and actively going through the responses, but also lets them know that their contributions are important. And finally, human connections aren't just between the moderator and the participant. It can be between participants as well. If you choose any level of socialization, it's nice to encourage casual discussions so that participants can get to know one another outside of the research questions. A great way to do this is by creating a participant only section in the discussion area of the site where they can add their own topics or alternatively, you could create a participant only thread where they can go and talk to one another about whatever's on their mind related to the topic at hand. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, financial stability at this time is at the forefront of everyone's mind, regardless of how secure they may feel. While we never want participants to be in it for the money, we do need to ensure that participants feel valued and are appropriately compensated for their time contributing to your study. So how do we make participants feel valued and help encourage them to participate? The first thing you wanna do is ensure that you clearly express why it's so essential that they participate in the project and tell them how their contribution will make an impact. While it seems like a small detail that can be often overlooked, participants are naturally curious and tend to want to know why the research is being conducted in the first place and how the information we'll be providing will be used. Providing those details can go a long way in making the participants feel essential to the project and more willing to openly share. Next, you'll wanna consider the incentives that you're offering themselves. And it isn't just about the dollar amount that you're offering for participating. It's about making sure that what you're offering is aligned with what the participant expects in terms of how valuable they feel their time is and what you're asking them to do. To do this, you'll first wanna think about your target. Different groups will expect or need different incentives to entice them to participate and keep them interested in completing the project. For instance, it's harder to reach um, you know, a niche audience or a B2B professional, and they might need a higher incentive to participate compared to the general population. You'll also wanna consider the method that participating in. If it's straightforward, say a one and done study, providing a straight incentive amount might work. But if you're asking participants to complete a pretest or multiple phases of work, you should not only consider the overall incentive amount, but how much they're getting per phase. So on a personal note, if I have a project that has multiple phases or I'm asking a lot of the participants, I might tend to you know, pay out an incentive for each part, but then also offer a bonus incentive for completing the project in full 
in order to get them to go through the whole project and complete everything. You'll also wanna consider the kind of incentives you plan to offer. It's great to have the incentive type match your target participant or the study, um, but you can also offer a wide range of incentive types they can choose from. Cash incentives are universal, but sometimes it's nice to leverage an incentive service where participants can choose how they wanna redeem their incentive, whether it's for a variety of different gift cards or maybe even donating to a charity of their choice. And lastly, keeping participants motivated and making them feel valued goes far beyond just how much you're incenting them to participate. It goes all the way back to the project expectations as well. So if you tell someone that they'll need to spend an hour doing your project and that they need to upload photos, make sure that it realistically would take someone an hour to do that and you're only asking them to upload photos. As researchers, we tend to severely underestimate the time people will put into a project and we don't wanna break that trust even if we feel the incentive is appropriate. So the last thing I wanna leave you with today is Avoid scope creep by ensuring that what you're asking of your participants matches that actual experience. And if you're conducting your project online using a platform like Recollective, it's really easy to preview your study and go through as a participant prior to it going live so you can ensure it actually does match those expectations. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined and I hope that you learned something new. If anything, the main point I hope you take away from this is the importance of being more participant-centric and intentional in your research approach. I think we have a few minutes for questions, um, but I encourage you to add me on LinkedIn and reach out directly if there's anything that we don't have time for today.